Hi friends, Apura Ki Khabar, Kasi Ho. I'm your host, Shamaya Bang Weinstein. I'm a peer educator, passionate about food and fitness, and a champion for reproductive health. For my third episode, we have questions from our peers for Dr. Catherine Dugarte about PCOS and fertility pill, with the hopes to create a greater awareness of fertility's ever ticking clock that stops for none. So make sure you subscribe, like, and don't forget to click on the icon button below for every time I post a new video. You heard that? Yes! Hi, Dr. Catherine Dugarte. Thank you for your time. Can you please introduce yourself? Hi, uh, my name is Dr. Catherine Dugarte, and I'm a reproductive endocrinology and infertility specialist, and I try to help lots of my patients have babies. Thank you, Dr. Dugarte, for your time. For this episode, we have some questions from our peers. One of our peers has sent in a video, and another one has sent in some questions in an email. So let's take a look at them. Hi, my name is Josefa. I am in my mid-20s and I'm a working professional. Um, ever since around 12 years old, I've been diagnosed with something called PCOS, which is polycystic ovarian syndrome. And being DC or, you know, South, of South Asian origin or of Bengali American, um, we just are in the society where we can't really share these things and I used to have this so much bottled up inside me that I couldn't share about my menstrual issues you know like I've dealt with being overweight and I've dealt with lots of hair growing issues in areas that I didn't want that <laughs> or um in particular like I have had these like aunties ask me oh my god why are you so like like big you know like physically and I'm just like um I'm having weight issues and losing weight because of the fact of my PCOS and I can't really explain that to people in my society and it's been really hard because I was so compressed and quiet with it till I grew older and I decided to talk and speak about it um PCOS is something that I just take it step by step and day by day and thank God for birth control for monitoring everything now and I've been leading a healthy lifestyle and leading a very healthy diet but that's all I can do with this um, but the backlash that you face from your society is crazy because you want to be in this you know this sisterhood and I just felt like I couldn't talk about my menstrual issues at all and it's just I was so suppressed with so much as a little kid and now growing up I've been thinking as a working professional of you know freezing my eggs and seeing my options and seeing what I could do um, and even now till now I'm just so um, fearful of what my community is going to say and think of that issue. So I have a few questions that I have um, for Dr. D, and I was wondering if she can answer them. Can you please tell us about PCOS? PCOS, it's a polycystic ovarian syndrome. It's a very common disorder. 6% of women actually have polycystic ovaries. It's in fact the most common um, disorder, endocrine disorder of reproductive age women. And the reason I deal with a lot of PCOS patients is that it can cause infertility because women with PCOS can have irregular periods and have a harder time getting pregnant. 
Some of them have an increase in hair on their face or their body. Sometimes they have increased testosterone levels or sometimes they have polycystic appearing like ovaries. The difficult part about polycystic ovaries is that sometimes the follicles are empty. They don't have any eggs in them. And sometimes it's hard to get the eggs to actually ovulate. Sometimes the ovaries are very resistant um, to ovulation in these patients. And so it's sometimes a little more challenging to get pregnant and also miscarriages can sometimes happen more often. Does having PCOS affect the egg freezing process? It doesn't affect the egg freezing process at all, but it can affect the risk of hyperstimulation syndrome because people with PCOS have more follicles and their AMH level is higher, and so they have a higher chance of having something called hyperstimulation syndrome after the procedure. Um, so you have to give them something called the Lupron trigger to prevent that. And also sometimes, the, as we talked about earlier, the follicles can be empty, and so sometimes even though you have a lot of follicles, a lot of them don't have eggs in them in patients with polycystic ovaries. So it's not gonna affect the egg freezing process as long as you have a lot of eggs. And sometimes PCOS patients actually have more eggs with their egg freezing cycles. You just have to be more careful. What can one do to preserve her eggs? So uh, a lot of women nowadays choose to freeze their eggs or they choose to get uh, either a friend or an unknown sperm donor or their partner so they can freeze their embryos. And I do recommend it for all women, really after 30 for sure, to get their fertility evaluated, uh, their ultrasound and blood tests to see how fertile they are and to consider freezing eggs or embryos if they're not ready to have a kid um, in, the, in the next five to 10 years. What would be the best age to freeze eggs? Today, the sooner you freeze your eggs, the better, um, because obviously the older we get, the, hard, the harder it is to get pregnant and our egg quality decreases every day. So I always tell patients, it's always better to freeze your eggs sooner rather than later, but some people have more time depending on your hormone levels and your ultrasound findings. Some people can wait six months to a year to freeze their eggs. Some people have to do it as soon as possible. What is the process of egg freezing? So the process of egg freezing is basically very similar to the process of in vitro fertilization for patients trying to get pregnant. Um, patients have to take fertility medications for about 10 days. And during that time, they come in for ultrasounds and blood tests to see how things are working in terms of stimulating the ovaries. And then these shots make the follicles uh, grow. And in these follicles, there's eggs and then they undergo something called an egg retrieval procedure where we remove the eggs under ultrasound guidance around day 12 of the cycle. So it's about a two week total process of time to freeze your eggs and then they can stay frozen from anywhere from months to years until um, you're ready for them. Does the egg freezing process hurt? So the Taking the medications um, is not very painful. It causes a little bit of stinging when you do the shots. The process of the egg retrieval, um, it's under anesthesia, so you don't feel it while it's happening. Um, the pain comes afterwards, um, after the egg retrieval, where you can feel like you're having a really bad period and you have some bleeding and some cramping that can last up to a week. Um, so the day of the egg retrieval and 48 hours later is when the most of the pain is, but it's like a heavy, painful period. Are there any health risks or side effects in freezing eggs? So egg freezing itself, uh, it's not a guarantee for a baby um, because there's been more babies born to patients who freeze their embryos rather than patients who freeze their eggs. So there is a possibility that your eggs will not result in a baby. So I usually tell patients at least 14 eggs for one baby, depending on their age, but that's the average. Um, the biggest uh, risk of freezing your eggs is obviously doing the fertility medications and having something called hyperstimulation syndrome, especially if you have a lot of eggs, where the ovaries get very enlarged and you have fluid in your belly and it can cause pain. Um, it can also cause something called ovarian torsion where your ovaries twist, which is why I tell my patients not to have exercise or sex during the process so that doesn't happen. Um, so those are the biggest risks and obviously risks from anesthesia, infection, bleeding at the time of the egg retrieval, those are all very, very rare. So I would say um, definitely get your fertility evaluated as soon as possible. No matter how old you are, I would say after the age of 25 really would be a good time to get your uh, fertility evaluated by doing an ultrasound and a blood test called an anti-mullerian hormone 
E2 and FSH level. The E2 and FSH level have to be done on day two or three of the period if you're not on birth control pills or you don't have a Mirena IUD inside. Um, otherwise, the AMH can be done at any time. The ultrasound can be done at any time. And the more follicles you have, the lower the AMH and... Um, I'm sorry, the higher the AMH and the lower the FSH level, the better chance of your fertility and um, you have a little more time to freeze your eggs than patients who don't have a lot of follicles who have abnormal hormonal results. Our second guest would like to be anonymous and she has sent over a message with her concern. Let's read this message. Hi, my husband and I have been trying to conceive for 10 years, so we decided to do IVF. Before starting the treatment, I came across this YouTuber from our Bangladeshi community and her posts about some fertility pills. My husband said it shouldn't be that easy and perhaps she's doing it for money. I still bought the sets of pills twice since the first set didn't work. Also because I thought after all the money we were spending on IVF, how much were we really spending on these fertility pills? I did everything she suggested in her YouTube video and nothing worked, so I felt very disappointed. Disappointed at myself for believing her and to see how convincing she was like body, time, and money are a joke. My husband didn't believe her, but also he doesn't believe everything on social media, but I had to learn the hard way. Everything I consumed went through me. I pretty much had to flush out my body to prepare for the IVF to make sure there aren't any mishaps. My infertility journey has been a learning process. I've noticed, and no offense to any mothers out there, but having a baby seems to be such a trend on social media. It's heartbreaking that someone can take advantage of one's dream of becoming a mother to their advantage of becoming a blogger. Should they always be trusted about everything they post in regards to motherhood and fertility? So I have some questions for Dr. D. Sincerely, Anonymous Viewer. There's a global market, net worth almost $1 billion, and there are so many fertility pills that are being promoted by bloggers, YouTubers. What do you think about these pills? I think they should talk to their doctor about which pills they actually need because you don't need to be taking supplements that you obviously aren't any studies behind or you have to be careful because some supplements have other preservatives and other chemicals in them so you have to be very careful of what you put in your mouth and I always tell patients is don't take anything that you don't know exactly what it does or you don't talk to somebody who recommends it or has experience using that supplement. So I think there are some great supplements that have some studies behind them, such as CoQ10. That's one that has been well studied in terms of fertility um, because it helps improve the mitochondria and the eggs and it helps with egg quality. So that's one of the better studied um, supplements. Um, there are some other supplements such as DHEA, uh, which gets a lot of popularity. However, it has to be used with cautions and patients with polycystic ovaries because it can cause more acne and more problems. Um, so I think it's, there isn't one pill that's good for everybody. To You don't take one pill and you have a baby. I think that's a myth and that's not true. Uh, however, I think having a very healthy lifestyle and avoiding marijuana and smoking and alcohol and eating healthy and um, not overly exercising and taking supplements that are right for you that have to be individualized with your doctor is the best course for, for having a healthy baby. Do you think these pills are giving women false hope, possibly even creating mental and physical damage? I think what happens is sometimes people ha take supplements for three years before they consult the fertility doctor. And by then, I have seen patients like this who've just taken all over-the-counter um, supplements. And then by the time they come see me, they're 43, 44, and they've wasted precious time. Um, so I don't think it's bad to take supplements, but I don't think supplements alone is the answer. Um, and I don't think IVF alone is the answer. I think a combination of the two is good, and I think it has to be individualized, and it's, again, not the cookie-cutter approach. What would you recommend a woman can do to help improve egg quality? So, um, like we talked about earlier, a healthier lifestyle is really great, decreasing stress, uh, eating healthy, lots of fruits and vegetables, uh, increased organic uh, foods in the diet, no preservatives, um, avoiding uh, plastics, and also um, avoiding marijuana, avoiding smoking, alcohol, um, 
and processed foods like we talked about, but also just improving lifestyle with prenatal vitamins and supplements that are specifically for that person. What do you think about egg donors and when should one consider an alternative method when all fails? I have lots of patients who uh, try on their own with their own eggs um, to have a baby and when that doesn't succeed at some point they do need to uh, make the decision to proceed uh, with using an egg donor and I have many patients that have successfully delivered healthy babies using an egg donor uh, either their sisters or their friends or anonymous donors either frozen or fresh eggs and I think it depends on the, on the person's ovaries, but if somebody, for example, has a very high FSH level and no follicles, um, or somebody who's born without any eggs, um, some conditions happen that way, um, they should definitely go to an egg donor or some people who have medical conditions that do not want their babies to have it. Um, sometimes they go through egg donors as well. There are so many celebrities and social media influencers these days having babies despite their age and fertility issues. How is this even possible? So some of the patients uh, and people in the media um, who, who tell other um, patients that they got pregnant at 45, 46 um, are doing a disservice to the general public because I think a lot of the times after 45, people get pregnant or have babies, it's usually either they froze their embryos or eggs earlier or they used an egg donor. And telling patients um, that they had babies at let's say 48, for example, like some people have done in the media, um, it's a big disservice to other patients because they say, well, so-and-so had a baby at 48, so that means I'm only 42 now. I can wait six more years since so-and-so had a baby at 48. So it's actually... Um, kills a lot of the years for these patients and I've had people who come to me and say I'm 44 and I didn't get come to you earlier because I saw all these people in People Magazine who had a baby after 45 so I thought if they can do it I can wait as well but unfortunately a lot of people aren't honest um, I think more and more people are open about their fertility journal and I think that's great and empowering to other women um, that they're not alone um, but I think a lot of people are still in the closet about fertility unfortunately well, number one is what you're doing, Shemaya. I think it's amazing that you are um, telling patients what's out there, what's reality, and uh, having more doctors uh, talk about it, more patients um, you know, who are in the media talk about their, uh, their fertility struggles. Um, I think that's very empowering for women. And I think more and more people are freezing their eggs, talking to their friends about it. I know I've had a lot of patients who have their friends come to me because some of their other friends froze their eggs or had babies with me. So I think people are definitely talking more than they used to in the past. And, um, and it's interesting how it's from over the course of 15 years that I've been doing this, I, I do see that it's not such a stigma as it used to be in the past. It's not, fertility is not in the closet as much as it was. And now I think people are talking about it and they feel empowered that they're not alone. Thank you so much, Dr. Dugarte, for answering questions from our peers. Stay tuned for future episodes of Lifesavers. I'm your host, Shamaya Bang Weinstein. For more information, contact CMD Fertility at 310-873-1800. And if you have any questions for our doctor, please feel free to reach out to me either on Facebook or Instagram at Shamaya Bang.